Good morning. Just a few brief announcements from the back page of the bulletin. We will have our Bible study this evening at 7 o'clock here at the church. Uh, nominating committee is meeting tomorrow at 7, as are the deacons. Then Tuesday at 10 in the morning, there's a ladies' Bible study here. And session will meet at 7. Wednesday, kitchen cleaning, uh, help needed. So as, as you like, please come and volunteer for that. And then Thursday, Circle 2 meets here. Hostess is Ruthie O'Connor and leader is Linda Chicka. All women of the church are welcome. would ask you now to please turn to page three in the bulletin to the call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. The Lord be with you. Let us worship God with these sentences of scripture. May I never boast of anything by which the world has been crucified to me. Let us pray. God of mercy, help us to forgive as you have forgiven us. Help us to trust you, even when hope is failing. Help us to take up our cross daily and to follow you in your redeeming work through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And now if you would turn in the blue hymnals to hymn number 263, 263. Now, let us pray. Holy God, you spoke this creation into existence 
And now speak to us so that we can hear through the many voices that surround us, that would speak to us, that would call us in other ways to other places. Give us grace in all the surrounding noise and hum, that we hear your voice clearly and respond to your call. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Our first reading today is from the prophet Isaiah, We're reading in chapter 50, verses 4 to 9. So listen for the word of the Lord. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him or her who is weary. Morning by morning, he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near, who will contend with me. Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. And now let us take a few moments in silence and reflect on these words and how God might act in our own lives and our own calling. Now, God, as we hear your voice, let us respond with courage and grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. We have a second reading from the Gospel of Matthew. It will be read today by our lector, Ruth O'Connor. reading from the New Testament, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 24 through 31. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather than a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See it to yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and our children. Then he released Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail! king of the Jews, and they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, 
They stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. Here end the readings. Thanks be to God. We have another odd passage from Isaiah today. The more I looked at this, the longer my thoughts got, the longer the sermon got. Uh, So I'm going to try to condense them somewhat for us. I'd like to look at what's happening in Isaiah's time. And then take a look at how the New Testament writers looked at this and used this and applied it to Jesus. And then I want to take a look at, uh, I found a similar situation today that that I think will explain this for us in our time and put before us the same basic challenges. But here, here in Isaiah, the, the situation addressed is to Israel in exile, that is, slavery in Babylon. And in, in this passage, uh, and you'll, you'll see it four times, that, that God is the primary actor. Four times the Lord God gives, he opens, he sustains, and he vindicates But the word of the Lord comes to an unspecified servant. Uh, Some people will tell you that it is Israel. Some people will tell you that Isaiah in his great vision has looked forward to Jesus. But I think to stay simply with the text, it's best to say that God has called a servant to the specific task of speaking his word to the nation of Israel, underlying that is the idea that Israel is in captivity because of their sin, and this is a message that they don't want to hear. Um, Second thing we see is, still in verse 4, morning by morning he awakens, he, he opens my ear, that There has been a long period of preparation of this servant so that he has been taught over days, months, years, possibly a lifetime. Um, If it's Isaiah, we have a very powerful call story early in the book. And he's called to be sent to the weary. And certainly Israel is represented here. They are the ones who are downtrodden. They are the ones who are in slavery. They are the ones who are, at this point, suffering for what they have done. And with this message, he's told the servant will be faithful, but he will be faithful at great cost. He will be beaten, he will be insulted, he will be disgraced. Uh, Being shamed in the Middle Eastern culture was essentially to lose everything. And yet, knowing this, going in, he hides not his face from disgrace and spitting. And the reason he can do this is because he knows that God is with him. That going into this very difficult situation, however it turns out, the fact that God is with him will keep him from being disgraced and it gives him the moral stability and strength to go ahead with this message knowing that the suffering he will undergo is for a greater purpose. And here at at the end of the verses where he says all of them will wear out like a garment, the moth will eat them up. 
reminds me that the word of the Lord stands forever and that what a person faces in this lifetime is temporary. So here we have someone called to do God's work who knows they will suffer greatly and says, yes, I will go ahead knowing that you are with me, God. So now I want to fast forward to the time of Jesus. I'm just going to round it off to approximately 500 years, five centuries, and pick up Jesus at his trial. Um, Just before our passage, which Ruthie read for us, uh, Matthew says at his trial before the religious leaders, They spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him. And again in the passage that Ruthie read for us, they spit on him, this is Jesus, and struck him on the head. And Mark picks up the ending of this, so to speak. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged, that is, whipped Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So when the New Testament writers see these events in Jesus' life, they can look back to this passage in Isaiah and say, oh, this is how the servant of the Lord is treated. This is how God has worked Before, God has sent a servant in Isaiah's time to reconstruct Israel and bring them out of slavery and send them back to the land, and that did happen finally. Jesus fits this pattern almost perfectly. So what we see in Jesus is God incarnate working to free us from something much, much greater than the slavery of Babylon, but to free us from the slavery of sin. This is how God acts to save God's people. He works through a servant who is obedient and willing to suffer. That's that's the, the story here so far. God works through servants who are obedient, who will speak his word, and are willing, if necessary, to suffer for it. Paul, who is called St. Paul, as we call him today, uh, not too much later, uh, maybe only a few years, maybe only a couple years, uh, meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. He accepts the call, knowing the challenges, And I'll just read some of the things that happened to him. He says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. He gave them his back. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. In danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. We could go on. He's got a pretty good list here, but clearly... Being as a servant of the Lord may come with its challenges. Some of them emotional, some of them spiritual, some of them social, some of them physical. It can be a tough place to be a servant of the Lord. Now I want to think a little bit first about our culture today and then then an event that uh, is, is very recent that I think will let us think about our calling as disciples in this time. Um, First of all, I want to look at the culture to which we're called to speak that does not want to hear the Christian message. And it's, it's not so much, I've thought about this a lot, it's not so much that people today are against Christianity because they really don't know what Christianity is. 
They have not read the founding documents. They have no idea of its length and breadth. They have no idea that most of the good and major institutions in our culture were started by Christians, even Harvard, most hospitals. It was Christians who uh, first gave women and slaves freedom within the church. Uh, just a lot of the good that, that, has, that is in the world comes from Christianity. But what we have is to we're challenged to speak against what people think Christianity is, which is in almost every case a distortion. And we're called to a time and culture who believes that if I believe it, it's true. Okay? Or we define our own concepts of what is right and what is wrong. And to say to this culture that there is a God who has a moral standard is not going to be received well, and it won't be received well. And it's also a time when many, a majority, I, th I think the data will show, to whom God is irrelevant, Salvation is irrelevant. So, so right off the bat, we, we have a challenge to speak to these. And um, I don't know if you've been following the news in, in the Texas abortion bill. Um, but Texas has a, basically a bill that would limit abortion. And this just came across my feed this morning. And the title is, Tesla should say something. Okay, Tesla's a big energy company. They make cars, they make robots, they make spaceships. Uh, they make a boring machine. I don't know where that's going. But anyway, they're, they're a huge company. They're like Amazon or Google or Microsoft or Apple. They, uh, one tweet from Elon Musk can change the whole financial market. Okay, they're, they're a big company and they have a lot of power. And Tesla should say something, and this is written by a woman, Connie Loizos. But that's not the full import of what she's saying. Okay. Uh, where do I start here? Okay, apparently American Airlines has spoken out against abortion, and somebody wrote to ask her, why should they? Why should American Airlines care about abortion? Why should they take a stand? She goes on to say the bill is unconstitutional, but here, here's the part that, that really caught my eye. She says, still there are more reasons than not for tech companies, and particularly Tesla, to step out of the shadows and bat down this law. Okay. Why would Tesla do that? It's a fact, she says, that abortion restrictions lead to higher health care costs for employers, but one consequence of the Texas law that could hit tech companies especially hard is its impact on hiring. According to a study by the Social Enterprise Reaventure, 60% of women say they would be discouraged from taking a job in a state that has tried to restrict access to abortion. Okay. Same is true for a slight majority of men. It also, Tesla's abortion law also creates an extrajudicial enforcement mechanism that should alarm tech companies and cost them money. Rhetorical question, what's the problem here? The problem here is we're taking a moral issue. Is it right or wrong to kill an unborn child and making it into a financial decision? If it costs you more money, then clearly it's wrong. Th this is a huge, huge step away from any moral structure that we have in America. If we make all our moral decisions on cost, where is that going to lead us? What about end-of-life issues? 
why should I hit my insurance for $90,000 or $190,000 or $900,000 for somebody that's 88 years old and is going to die next month anyway? Right? And we could just go on and on and on and on with this. But this is a reflection of at least part of the culture at large. It's their right to make moral decisions according to their criteria. And I can guarantee you if you speak against that abortion or for that abortion bill, you will get pushback. If you somehow get out on one of the major feeds, if you were to get out on Rogan and say that Joe Rogan and say that, you would get pushback and you would be persecuted and you would suffer. And my bigger question is, where's the church? I haven't heard one church speak up here. And maybe that's why we're not as effective as we used to be. And maybe they have and I just haven't heard it. But the, for, for me, read, reading that article, the, the final question is, do we want decisions of life and death to be made on the basis of finance? So you see, Texas tries to make an ethical and moral decision, and the culture pushes back and says, no, it's a financial one. It's not to your benefit to support that bill. You'll lose money. <laughs> and it's Isaiah all over again. So I, I think... <laughs> And this is where I just stopped and thought, how, how, do, how do we approach this? Uh, you know, I, I think we can say broadly that where we see these patterns working out from the prophets to Jesus to today, we're seeing the way God works. But what we're not seeing here is the prophet speaking against this. That disturbs me. But there are ways of telling when we are in God's vision, and, and that's, that's from the responses we get. Um, my experience, and it's limited in speaking to people outside the church, is that they are spiritually hungry and they want to hear what we have to say. Um, I've had more than one conversation that went on for a long time. What do you believe here? What do you think here? What do you... Um, so at least in cases like that we need to answer with integrity and honestly and I think when we do we might expect most of the time people are pretty polite once in a while you run into somebody that's almost violent um but I, I think it's time minimally for us to be willing to stand and say, you know, that I believe the gospel, I believe there is a moral imperative that God gives us, and that this is where I stand. But I'll leave you for the moment to think about that. Let's pray. Holy God, in our time, in our place, Tune our ears to hear your prophets because we know that you do nothing without telling your prophets and they will speak to us. So let us listen. In Christ our Lord, amen. couple things here uh, as we go into prayer I uh, have a request uh, from Connie for Tommy Brown who's back in the hospital apparently his, he has immune reaction to the cancer treatment he's getting and I also have a request prayers for the Ankeny family 
Scott's brother Steve passed away this week. So we'll keep those two in our prayers. And now let us go to God in prayer. Holy God, each day, somewhere through the course of our life, you give us a reminder that you are God and there is no other. Somewhere we get a reminder that you have heard us, that you have spoken and nudged us or healed us or pushed us in some new direction. So give us wisdom, strength, courage, faith, to listen to your voice and to begin with these tiny nudges, to speak your word, to live your word, to be your word, to show your word, however you call us. Let us know that however life turns out, we can rest in you, that in you we are known through our faith to be pure and innocent. And now we turn towards communion. We turn to our coming sharing of this meal with you, when we remember that you took the cup and the bread. And so it is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise. O oh Lord, our God, creator and ruler of the universe, that in the fullness of time you sent your son to be your suffering servant, to be one of us, to redeem us and heal our brokenness. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine. That the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. And as we remember this meal, let us also remember the Ankney family, Tommy Brown, all those who suffer for you and with you. Lead us by your great grace always back to this communion with you, praying this in Christ's name. Now, before we gather for communion, let's sing together the hymn which I skipped. <laughs> I'm not going to try to wiggle out of it. <laughs> or excuse it, I just skipped it. Uh, hymn 371, Lift High the Cross.
now we come to the time when we will share communion together. Does everyone have a communion service? Okay, down here in the front, Ruthie. Mike. <laughs> okay. uh, just a reminder, if you haven't used these before, there's two uh, pieces of plastic here. One covers the bread and the other covers... <laughs> And this one's being stubborn, but there are um, two pieces of plastic. One covers the bread. There you go. The other seal breaks and will allow you to drink the juice. If you are at home with us and you have prepared your juice or your wine and your bread, we ask that you share with us as we together share Christ's meal. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread, something like a small pita loaf, and he took this bread and he tore it or broke it and passed it to his disciples. And as he did this, he said, this bread is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. And so today as we gather together as one body in Christ, we take this bread and share it, take and eat. After this, Jesus took wine, small cup, he poured it, he blessed it, he passed it, and as he passed it, he said, this wine represents my blood, which will be shed for you, take and drink. And so together we do the same. We share this cup. Take and drink. Let us pray. God, you have gathered us together. We have heard your word. We have shared this meal Send us now into your world to speak your word and to do your work through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.
now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you.